All right. All right, so uh, at the end of last time, we uh, were talking about neutral coalescent theory, right? And we were working within this sort of exceptionally simple model where we just had some population size n and some mutation rate u, and we had imagined that all the selective effects were zero, so none of the mutations has any effect uh, on the fitness of the organisms. And we talked about how making, you know, within the context of this very, very simple model, we could write down the probability of any possible genealogical history um, of a sample of individuals from a population. And as you may remember, what we basically said is, let's say that you sample some number of individuals, little n, in the present. Okay, the distribution of the time in which, let's say that at a given moment there are k extant lineages, the distribution of the time until one pair of those lineages has some common ancestor was given by an approximately exponential distribution. Well, let me write it out actually sort of fully. It would be 1 minus the k choose 2 over n to the t minus 1. They have, have to have not had a common ancestor for t minus 1 generations. And then in the final generation, they did have a common ancestor. The probability a given pair, uh, that, that some pair has some common ancestry, is the k choose 2. That's the number of different possible pairs that could coalesce. Uh, times 1 over n, because the probability any given pair has a common ancestor in this simple model was 1 over n. And because there's no selection, everything is neutral, all the lineages are exactly equivalent, any pair is as likely to coalesce as any other pair. And so this, you know, this um, distribution of coalescence times, which we'll often treat as approximately exponential, Sorry, I should write that out here. Okay, This distribution of coalescence times combined with the observation that all the lineages are equivalent, and so one thing is this likely to coalesce, all pairs are equally likely to coalesce, that's called exchangeability. The combination of these two things completely determines the distribution of possible genealogical trees. Right. So we talked about, for instance, if you had four individuals in the present, like this is one potential genealogical tree. This time here, we would call T4. This time here, we would call T3. And this time here, we would call T2. The mean of this time would be n. The mean of this time would be n over 3. The mean of this time would be n over 4 choose 2, which is n over 6, and so on and so forth. And sorry about that. And um, so we have the distribution of all the branch lengths. And if you think about this property of exchangeability, you'll see that you know, this is one possible topology of the tree, which, as we saw, had probability 2 thirds. And the other topology had pro would have probability 1 third. Okay? And you know, you can obviously, things start to get a bit hairy when you start to have larger samples. So like if you had a sample of five individuals, the number of possible topologies gets much larger. And you know it's kind of a drag to compute their, their relative probabilities. When you start talking about samples of 100 individuals, it gets obviously you know, even more complicated. But like in principle, there's nothing at all compli complicated about it. We know the probability of all possible genealogies. And there's been like a huge amount of study of all of the kind of mathematical properties of this kind of tree space. Okay? So for example, like one thing, even in arbitrarily large samples, one sort of way that the, one sort of manifestation of this exchangeability property, it's sort of hard to think about, like if you have a sample of 100 individuals, what are all the probabilities of all possible topologies? But one thing that you, know, is, uh, that, that, that you can make use of is the fact that like, if you look at any node in this tree, the distribution of the number of leaves at the bottom of the tree that descends from each side of the node will be uniform. Okay? That's another way to think about the topological structure of the tree. Um, <clears throat> there's various other things. I mean, this sort of a lot of study of that. 
So basically, once we have this distribution of possible genealogies, we can from that compute what we expect genetic vari any sort of property of genetic diversity within the sample to look like, what, would, what we expect it to look like. So the sort of simplest version of this is, as I sort of talked about briefly last time, if we have a sample of just two individuals, okay, this is the only topology that such a tree can have, obviously. Um, and we only have one time here. This is T2. And we know that the probability of T2 is uh, 1 over n e to the minus t over n. Okay. And uh, the expectation of T2 from this is just n. Okay. And so the basic um, assumption here is going to be, because everything is neutral, the mutations and the genealogy are completely independent. So we can compute the diversity. So the only possible aspect of diversity we can compute between these two individuals is just the heterozygosity. We have two individuals, so they have some number of differences. There's really nothing more to be said in this simple case. And so what we can say is that the probability distribution, it's traditional to refer to heterozygosity as pi in population genetics for reasons I do not understand. Um, but the distribution of this pi okay, is just going to be the probability that T2 takes on some particular value times the probability you get that value of pi given that value uh, of T2 summed over all possible values of T2. Okay, from 0 to infinity. All right, we know what this is. And the probability of pi given t is also straightforward because it's sort of in, it's independent. Of, once you know t, right, all you, what you know is that mutations occur as a Poisson process each generation. Okay, so there are two t generations here. So there are, uh, and there's expected to be on average uh, u mutations per generation. So basically, p okay, of pi given t okay, is a Poisson distribution with mean 2ut. Right? So it's 2ut to the pi uh, over pi factorial e to the minus t ut, 2ut. Okay? So this tells us the distribution of the number of differences. Okay? And you know you can just plug. I'm not going to do it on the board, but you can just plug this in, and from this you'll calculate the probability distribution of pi. It's a straightforward integral to compute. Okay. And uh, you know an obvious conclusion of this is that the expectation of pi is just two times u times the expectation of t2, which is two n u. Okay. Which often in population genetics this combination of parameters is traditionally called theta. Okay? So this provides a basis for inference now. Okay? So what you could imagine doing, you know, I could imagine going out and, you know, well, I could imagine sequencing all of you guys in the room, all right? Take all possible pairs of you, compute the heterozygosity of these pairs. Okay, I know the probability of pi. Okay, given these parameters, it'll turn out when I do this integral. You can sort of see it. It'll only depend on theta. Okay, and so what I'll have is a probability of pi given theta, and I can use that as the basis for inference, given that you know I know the distribution of pi, and I can compute a maximum likelihood estimate for theta. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the maximum likelihood estimate that I'll get is 2nu. Okay? So traditionally, like what we'll do okay, is you will measure pi, okay, and then your maximum likelihood estimate of theta is pi. Okay? So like pi is a measurable quantity, and then you will infer that the 2nu relevant to that population is whatever the observed pi is. So how many of you have heard of a concept called effective population size? Okay. So this is one of the worst concepts in population genetics theory. <laughs> not, not really because it's fundamentally bad, but because the people that use it do so in often stupid ways. 
So, you know, I mean, in physics, this happens all the time, right? Like you have some complicated theory, and you make an analogy, or you have some complicated theory, and then you can show that it's like equivalent to some simpler theory if we define some effective parameters in the simpler theory that actually are combinations of parameters in the more complicated theory. Right? And in, in that sense, this po effective population size is perfectly sensible and well-defined. The problem is just that people make extrapolations from it which are not justified. So what people often do, right? they measure pi, the average pi, in some sample of individuals. And then they say that equals theta. Okay? And you know they'll get a number. Okay? Right? So for humans, what is it? One in a thousand. Okay, does anyone know what u is in humans? No, this is the genome wide mutation rate now that we're talking about. 10 to the minus 8 per base pair is correct. Yeah, I mean, more like 50, but yeah. Okay, so 2 times 50, we'll call it 100. Okay, so what's the n for humans? Yeah, in that range, right, from this, right? Does that make any sense? <laughs> OK, so it never makes sense, right, <laughs> for basically anything that you look at. So what they do is they say, well, OK, I'm going to call, I'm going to say that the population is sort of effectively doing this, and we call whatever n you get out of this effective population size. Okay. What we really should do, actually, is think of it as whatever your estimate of pi is, and the thing that's sort of really the estimate of pi is the estimate of is is it's a measure sorry the measure of pi that you observe is an estimate of the average pairwise coalescence times in units of the mutation rate. Okay. Anyway, that's sort of an aside. All right. Now let's imagine that we have a larger sample, right? I talked about like sequencing all of you guys in the room and just computing the average pi from that, which is something I can do, right? If I have all of your sequences, I have all I can make all possible pairs, compute the pi between all possible pairs, get the observed expectation of pi. But I can also do more complicated things. Like so for example, I could take you know, three individuals, okay? This is the genealogy here, okay? And we can say something about the site frequency spectrum. If you think about it, okay, if I know the ancestral allele, right, there's, there's, if you have a polymorphic site, it can be present in one of these three individuals, two of the th or, or two of the three individuals. Right? Those are the two possibilities. If it's zero or three, then it's not a polymorphic site in this sample, at least. Right? And so we can think about, well, where could mutations have occurred along this genealogy Okay, to produce a polymorphic site uh, that has some frequency in the sample, in this case, either one or two, one third or two thirds. Those are the two possible frequencies. Where is a colored chalk? Here's one a little. Oh, yeah, thanks. Great. All right. So to be present in two of the three individuals, there's only one place that those mutations could have occurred. Okay? That's here. Okay? And to be present in one of the three individuals, mutations could have occurred here, here, or here. Okay? So this branch has length what? T2, right? Which is on average n. This branch has length what? T3. This branch has this branch, T2 plus T3, right? And I know the distributions of all these things. And like just, I mean, to keep it simple, we can say like, OK, what is the average fraction of polymorphisms that are present in two of the three, OK? So the average fraction of, the, the fraction of polymorphisms that are present in two of the three is T3, OK, over the total branch length of the tree, right? which is, sorry, t2, which is 2t2 plus 3t3, right? So this is like, and, and, and then the, the, the fraction that's present in one of the individuals is 1 minus that, right? 
And so that's an estimate of the site frequency, the expected site frequency spectrum is the expectation of this, right? And you know, if you had, you could imagine four, indiv looking at four or five individuals, right? Like here's a tree with five individuals, okay? And you could figure out now a polymorphism can have frequency one, two, three, or four, right? And in order to have a frequency one, it has to have occurred on this branch, this branch, this branch, this branch, or this branch, okay? Now we have to sort of think about the topologies, right? Because there's another topology for five would be this, okay? And now singletons, meaning polymorphisms present in one out of the individuals in the sample are here, 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 and here, okay? And so we need to know not just the branch lengths, but the relative probabilities of the, these topologies, blah, 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 okay? But we can compute all this stuff, right? This framework allows us to do that. And I'm not going to sort of go over on the board. It's a sort of a quite complicated calculation. There's a few different ways to do it, actually. Um, but people, you know, thought about this carefully, okay? And they found they prove a sort of remarkably simple result, okay? Even in arbitrarily large samples, okay, what you can show is that the probability, okay, of having a polymorphism, okay, that's present, given that a site is polymorphic, the probability of its frequency being x, okay, goes like 1 over x, okay? And um, where x is, you know, i over, n, i over little n, okay? i is the number of individuals in which that polymorphism is found. Little n is the size of the sample. So in this case, the polymorphism, could, the x could take on values one-third or two-thirds. Or here it could be 20%, 40%, 60%, or 80%, or whatever, okay? All right? So there was a whole industry for quite a while, I guess I would say, about uh, where, you know, basically what people would try to do is, you know, sequence some individuals or in some other way assay variation. You know, in the old days, people couldn't do sequencing. So they had to find mutations in other ways, which is a sort of whole other subject, which is now largely irrelevant. Anyway, people would observe variation in samples of individuals, and then they would want to sort of test for neutrality. Okay. And basically what they're trying to do is test whether this model is a good description of the data. Okay. And um, so there are a variety of different ways to do that. Okay. But basically what they all boil down to at some level or another is taking different aspects of this data, which are reflected in different aspects of the site frequency spectrum, and comparing them. Okay. And uh, and asking whether that comparison made sense according to this model, okay? Because this model, right, it only actually has one parameter, which is theta, okay? I mean, I can actually write this more precisely. The total number of polymorphisms with frequency x should be, say, theta over x, okay, in this model, all right? And um, so we can do things like we can estimate theta by calculating the average pi, okay? And then the other thing that one could do is you could imagine I sequence everybody in this room, okay, and I compute the total number of polymorphic sites, which is like the total number of mutations anywhere on the tree, the genealogy that relates us here, okay? And that gives me a different estimate of theta, okay? And those two estimates, if the this is a good description of the genealogical history, those two estimates should match, okay? On the other hand, I mean, let's say that the genealogy of, the, uh, of, of, of those of us in the sample, uh, of those of us here, looks like this. Okay? This genealogy is sort of not so good. This is not a very probable genealogy, okay? Because these sort of lower branches are longer than the top branches, okay? And what that's going to mean is that somehow the heterozygosity is too big relative to the total number of segregating sites, the total number of polymorphisms within this sample, 
And so people constructed all kinds of st statistics trying to capture these different deviations of the, of the sort of structure, the branch lengths and the topologies of the observed trees from the expectation under the Kingman coalescent and use that to test for neutrality. So has anyone ever heard of something called Tajima's D? How many have you heard of that? Or Fu in Li's D star, or, or uh, God, I'm forgetting, Fei in Wu's H. Whatever these, you know, there's there's like whole industries around all these things, right? But people define all kinds of statistics. The most well known is Tajima's D, okay, which is like basically a difference in the maximum likelihood estimate uh, of theta that you get from the total number of segregating sites at the total number of mutations in your sample. Take the difference between that and the estimate that you get from the average heterozygosity that you observe divide by some complicated normalization, okay? And this, the, this should be zero, okay, if, the, if this model is correct. And if you observe statistically significant deviations from zero, then you conclude that this model is wrong, okay? And I guess, I don't know, I, I'm not really good at the, at the history of population genetics. I kind of try not to be. Um, you know, there's some things it's like better to be ignorant about if you want to do good science. Um, anyway, uh, the, but my sort of vague understanding of it is that, you know, 30, 40 years ago, you know, people would compute these things and the data was kind of crappy in those days. And so, you know, there wasn't much statistical power. And so people didn't really often reject neutrality. And it sort of led to this widespread belief that this neutral theory was a sort of good description. Okay. And now, more recently, we're getting sort of more and more data. Okay. And it's becoming clear that like, there's violations all over the place. Okay. And so, you know, I mean, that's actually in a way kind of good and interesting, right? Because, I mean, it shows that biology isn't really totally boring, or at least that evolution isn't totally boring. Um, uh, but it also, I mean, it means two things. I mean, it means that, that what we want to do is construct more complicated models than this, OK? All right, this very, very, you know, I've been sort of emphasizing the simplest possible models. This is apparently not quite simple. Uh, this is apparently a little bit too simple. We want to construct more complicated models and use them to sort of infer what more complex processes might be going on in the data. Okay? And that's what I'm going to sort of talk about, talk about a bit now. Right? Before I get into that, I just, I, well, I'm going to sort of now go back and forth a little bit with uh, just a couple of slides showing some empirical data. So here is a paper. This is ancient history now. This is from 2015. So it's really like the dark ages in terms of sequencing, right? I mean, we've gone up by like two orders of magnitude since then. But anyway, so this is a, a paper about um, sequence data from about 2,500 humans. Okay, this is uh, sort of... Yeah, it was called a thousand genomes. I mean, it's kind of weird, right? It just shows you how things, how quickly things change, right? There's a huge consortium effort called the Thousand Genomes Project Consortium, and they sequenced 2,504 individuals. Um, I'm not really sure what the story is there. Just to give you a sense of like the scope of these kinds of efforts, right? This is like a major effort. I mean, there's, there's, you know, there's other consortias like looking at Arabidopsis and all kinds, right? So, but this is. This is just one example of one of these consortia that like actually does this kind of sequencing. Uh, you know, this is the author list of that paper. Um, Why should we be yeah. shocked by this? I mean, there is LIGO, there is LHC. There are similar size consortia, maybe even larger. Yeah. I mean, I don't know whether or not you should be shocked, but this is new for evolution, right? I mean, it's it just showing, right? Like, I mean, this kind of bit, I mean, it's like a big industry on the scale of you know, LIGO or something, you know, in terms of the, you know, the, the, the effort being expended for whatever that's worth. All right. So here is an example. This is the site frequency spectrum that they observe. Okay. So, you know, there are 2,500 individuals. So the possible frequencies that you can observe are, you know, 1 in 2,500, 2 in 2,500, et cetera. Okay. And this on the, on the, on the y-axis, notice, notice the log scale here, 
is, well, the total number of polymorphic sites that are present at that frequency in this sample of 2,500. Okay? So what you can see is that, obviously, there are more rare alleles than common alleles. Okay? That's expected. Okay? But this doesn't look at all like 1 over x. Right? I mean, 1 over x would be a sort of straight line here. Okay, with slope 1. It's clearly not that. There's this sort of huge excess of rare variance okay, relative to common variance. There's, you know, this part looks reasonably like a straight line, okay, but obviously there's something going on here. There's this weird thing going on at high frequencies. Okay. This can come from two things. We'll talk in a little bit about how this can come from real processes involving selection, which you know, is one of the things that my lab has worked on. Um, it can also come from various artifacts. I mean, there's a lot of details about how this sequencing is actually done, how we tell what's the ancestral allele. And I mean, you can imagine that like, even if you have very good estimates of which is the ancestral and which is the derived allele, because low frequency mutations are so much more common than high frequency mutations. If you make errors in the ancestral allele you know, at a rate of 10 to the minus 5, and you take a fraction 10 to the minus 5 of these guys and put them over here, you can cause these kind of artifacts. Okay, so that's another sort of source of this. But anyway, you can see that, it's clearly, that it clearly doesn't follow you know, this simple picture, just not even close. Okay? So, all right. We are going to talk a little bit about now you know, what, what kinds of things people in the field are, are doing okay, to try to see what more complicated might be going on. So one of the really big things that people think is happening in lots of populations is that there's some complicated uh, demographic history. There's some, basically, that. You know, the human population, they believe, it's not one sort of population of a constant size that's sort of uh, randomly mating. Rather, you know, people think the population size of humans has expanded in the relatively recent past. That's undoubtedly true. Uh, and that there's all kinds of geographic structure that has led to different populations. So let's talk briefly about how to look at one particular aspect of this, which is the population size history. Okay? So you can take this basic coalescent model, okay, which I've assumed there's some constant population size and mutation rate. Okay? And imagine instead there's some time-dependent population size history. Okay? I'm still going to assume that time-dependent population size is set externally. right? I'm not breaking the barrier between ecology and evolution here. But let's just imagine that it, was, that, that, that it had some population size history. So now we have some size n of t. Okay? And we still have the, same, the constant mutation rate u. So people will often draw that. Okay, I'm going to sort of follow like a common convention. Okay? So this is the present. Okay, this is the past. Okay, and um, these these bars represent kind of the size of the population at that time. So here is like a simple scenario of a population that used to be small and now is big. Okay, and so we can compute. Let's imagine that we take two individuals and we sample them and we sequence them from the population. What is their distribution of coalescence times? Okay. We still have a neutral population, which at any given moment has some size. Okay. So in any, you know, from generation to generation, the probability of coalescence still just depends on the population size at that generation. Right? And so we can say right, the probability that the coalescence time is t. Okay. Well, you have to have, again, not coalesced for the previous times, okay, and then coalesced at that time. So what it's actually going to be is the product okay, of not coalescing let's call this n of tau, okay, 
Okay. All right. So you have to have not coalesced for the first t minus one generations, and then coalesced t generations, and t tau generations in the past, the population size was some value n of tau. And so the probability you didn't coalesce at that time is 1 minus 1 over whatever that population size was. And so you just multiply that out for each of these things, and then you multiply by this. This is the probability you did coalesce at that t. So you know, for this scenario, OK, I'm not going to write it. You could, you could figure this out, right? And so, and then you know, the same kind of deal applies if we have t3, t4, t5, t6. The basic thing that's going to happen is, OK, while population sizes are low, coalescence probabilities are also low. Sorry, other way. While population sizes are, are high, coalescence probabilities are low. And while population sizes are low, coalescent probabilities are high. And so like this scenario might plausibly give rise to a genealogy, let's say, that looks kind of like this. Okay. Right? There are these long branches here at the end, and then quick coalescence here. All right? So how many of you guys think this is like a reasonable explanation for this how this site frequency spectra look like? Does that look reasonable to you? Or at least, I mean, vaguely qualitatively in the right direction? Let's take a vote, OK? How many think it's good, uh, it, it's in the right direction? How many think it's in the wrong direction? How many don't know? All right. We have a clear consensus for don't know, which is actually probably the most. I mean, I guess I would argue that it is clearly kind of in the right direction. Okay, because if you look at this, right, this is leading to sort of long terminal branches, at least longer terminal branches relative to earlier branches. It's these terminal branches that lead to low frequency polymorphisms, and these branches at the top that lead to high frequency polymorphisms, right? And so this kind of effect is going to lead to a sort of excess of low frequency relative to high frequency polymorphisms compared to the 1 over x prediction of the constant population size. So, and that is what we observe. So that at least vaguely, yeah, OK. I can kind of, we can kind of buy that, right? Obviously, one can you know, talk about, OK, Maybe we shouldn't mark, view this as a stepwise increase in population size. One could imagine a gradual increase. I mean, there's various different kinds of models that one can do. And actually, I mean, there are probably thousands of papers being written, like arguing about like what, you know, should we think about a stepwise? Should we think about exponential? What should we do? And then trying to make inferences. I mean, people try to make detailed inferences of n of t in the context of these frameworks. I'll talk a bit more about that in a sec. Yeah. If I were to try to build, let's say, a rank ordered plot for how frequently does what how, what's the frequency of the the most frequent mutation, the sec second fre most frequent mutation, and so on and so forth, is that basically that plot? Yeah. Okay. And uh, but the other way around. Yeah. And so, does does it have any interesting scaling in it? Deep force, something like that. I mean. You know, so the, 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 the prediction is 1 over x. That's clearly not right. I mean, this is an observation for humans. Uh, you know, it does appear to have some, like, clear, I mean, that looks like a power law, right? A lot of people are going to ar will argue about this, OK? There's lots of potential explanations. And I guess what I want to get at is, you know, it turns out, I, I mean, I don't want to make too strong statements, but the, the problem is not that it's too hard to explain, I think. The problem is it's too easy to explain. Okay? And so what, um, you know, what I'm just saying, I mean, I, I'm not like getting a precise thing out here. Okay? But it's sort of not hard to imagine that one can choose values of n of t okay, for which you get an almost arbitrary site frequency spectrum. 
Okay, maybe not quite, but you can get almost anything by choosing an appropriate N of T. Okay. But if I have the same analysis for humans, monkeys, mice, etc., etc., and and it always comes out looking sort of similar with the same slogan, maybe there's some, something interesting there. If it's all yes, so uh, yes, so yeah, so yes, you're speaking my language. So what people. <laughs> What people do, okay, people do look at it. I'll, I'll show you some data from some fish, you know, but people look at it in, in mice and butterflies and Drosophila and various kinds of plants and different fish and all sorts of stuff, okay. And they always see stuff that kind of has this, at least vaguely kind of looks more like this than a neutral prediction, okay. And then they sort of infer population size history from that, and they always seem to get something qualitatively bottlenecky in the past. Okay. Now, one of the things which I will talk about as we go along is you can also get exactly this same kinds of distortions in the site frequency spectrum in just a simple model of purifying selection. And so, I mean, I would personally argue that that's a more generic and general explanation for this. And these distortions should not be seen primarily as a signature of historical population size, although they may reflect that. But that you know, clearly purifying selection is always happening, and that's like a natural null for these distributions. But that is actually not what most people in this field you know, think. And I think you know, there's a whole industry of people inferring N of T and you know, arguing about the best you know, the fastest methods to do so and the best modeling frameworks to do so within and so on. Well, okay, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to say too many derogatory things on tape, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, okay. All right, so, uh, all right, so this is one sort of thing, all right? And we can then, you know, also fit even more complicated things Okay, so you know, for humans, for example, and for lots of organisms, right? We believe that there's also some kind of population structure. Okay, so you know, another sort of thing we could imagine doing. Okay, we could imagine. Uh, this is really going to be hard for me to draw. Let me try my best. so bad at this. <laughs> OK. So you could imagine, for instance, that we think of human population history in the following way. These are, let's say, and maybe I should cut this guy off. These are Neanderthals. OK. These are some population in Africa, like Yorubans or something, and these are Central Europeans. Okay. And you know, we kind of believe that Central Europeans are mostly a sort of interbreeding population. The Africans are. Obviously, we think there's some gene flow back and forth because you know, uh, occasionally uh, people travel. And you know, at some point in the past, these two populations were one population, you know, before some out of Africa migration, let's say. And way in the distant past, of course, you know, humans and Neanderthals may have been one population which spread. And then maybe there was, you know, some gene flow, humans mating with Neanderthals at some point after the, the sort of species or whatever, the, these populations separate. How many of you have read about, you know, humans mating with Neanderthals? Right? There's like lots of big papers about that and controversy. And so anyway, so we can think of coalescent trees. Like imagine that we you know, sequence some individuals. Maybe we sequence some Africans, some Europeans. right? These guys have some coalescent history. Somehow, if something didn't coalesce for what, you know, by chance until this time in the past, then we get sort of shared polymorphisms. Of course, things could also sort of cross this barrier, but at much lower rates, right? And one can try to infer, basically, the, and, and then you, know, you go up and you dig up some Neanderthal bones, okay? And you sequence them, and you, know, you look at all this. 
And one could imagine, like, you know, you have some model of, like, the population structure or whatever, you know, the, these, what these different things are, how wide these things are, whether they're increasing or decreasing, how many different populations, when the populations merged and, you know, split from each other, uh, what the rates of gene flow are back and forth between the two. There's, like, a lot of parameters in here. Right? But you can imagine with enough data of this type, you could try to infer all these things from the structure of the trees that you observe. Okay? And people do that. So I just want to show you like a couple of examples. Okay? I don't want to go into all of the quantitative details of that. Before I do that, okay, I do need to sort of say a word now about recombination. So we can also, so far, we've talked about these trees, right? Genomes have ancestry, right? Like this. Okay? But actually, that's an oversimplification, right? If I sequence all of us in this room, okay, well, let's just, let's just say, actually, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to sequence the three of us here, okay? So, you know, we have a coalescent tree, okay, according to this thing that looks like this, okay? But it is not actually true that our whole genomes share the same coalescent tree with the same topology and the same branch lengths, right? Because of recombination, right? So some regions of our, in some regions of our genome, you two might be more closely related to each other than, than I am to either of you, right? In other regions of the genome, you and me may be closely related, and he may be the, this guy or whatever, right? And there could be different. And that's basically because, you know, if we look backwards in time, right, it's not just, you know, any given site in your genome has some ancestry, but whenever there's a recombination event backwards in time between two sites, what that does is it kind of splits the tree, right? And you can have now a different ancestry for the different sites, okay? And so, you know, if you think about that, okay, that makes this coalescent theory enormously more complicated. Okay. Because now, like, let's say we have a sample of 100 individuals. We go backwards in time. We start getting coalescence. But every time there's some recombination event in the past, it actually bifurcates the tree and makes it more complicated again. All right? And this whole thing like, leads to something which there's a sort of exact representation of. It's called the ancestral recombination graph. How many of you have heard of this before? No? All right. I'm not going to really belabor it, OK? Because people don't actually, it, it, it becomes very analytically, I mean, very even computationally, like pretty much intractable. So instead, you know, what people do is they um, make various approximations. And, and one approximation, oh, I'm sorry, oh, I'll come back to that. One approximation is, something called the sequentially Markovian coalescent. Okay? The idea is, let's imagine that I sequence, this is a slide I ripped off from Richard Durbin, who's a, a population geneticist in, in England, in Cambridge, uh, and, or at the Sanger, I should say, I think. Anyway, um, <clears throat> he developed uh, a method related to this. I'll show you the details a bit more in, in a moment. But the basic idea is, you know, if I sequence the two of us, or in fact, I don't even have to do that. I could just sequence me, right? And I have two copies of my diploid genome, right? So that's why it's called heterozygosity, right? Because if, if those two copies are different, we call that a heterozygous site. And if they're the same, we call it a homozygous site. So heterozygosity is just, you know, my two, you know, the assumption is that my two copies just come at random. So the heterozygosity between individuals is the same as the heterozygosity within individuals, right? So uh, that's the origin of the name. So anyway, so I go along these two homologous chromosomes, okay? And okay, I see polymorphisms, okay? And that, you know, tells me what the pi is in that region of the chromosome, okay? Which is an estimate of the coalescence time, the T2 there. But in the past, like if there was a recombination event somewhere between these things, now this region may have a different coalescence time than this one did, okay? But it's a sort of approximately Markov process where you know, sites that are close together are likely to share the same common ancestry because recombination is unlikely. But at every kind of time as you step along, eventually you're going to get a recombination event. And then that sort of decouples the genealogy. And this can have a different T2. 
So in a sense, by sequencing you know, even just a single individual and computing the heterozygosity along the chromosome, what you can do is actually get multiple samples of T2, okay? as many samples as you have these kind of recombination blocks okay? from, from a single individual. And one can actually compute like a whole distribution of T2 from a single individual. Okay? And you know, in, in this paper, okay, this is from like eight years ago now, okay? Uh, Lee and, 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 uh, and Durbin developed this what's called PSMC method. Uh, called for pairwise sequentially Markovian coalescent. Okay, it's basically just a hidden Markov model. You know, they look along the chromosome, right? And okay, they sort of see we're at a kind of place with with some relatively small coalescence time. So there's not many polymorphisms. Now all of a sudden we hit a region where there's a lot more polymorphisms altogether. And so we infer that there was a recombination event here and a different coalescence time. And we infer what that coalescence time is. And we do that again. Right? And we get some inference of the, of the distribution of coalescence times. And if you think about it, if you know the distribution of coalescence times, right, the coalescence, the, the rate at which you have, the, you know, the fraction of coalescence events in each interval in the path, past is a measure of 1 over the population size at that time. So from the distribution of coalescence times, you can infer the n of t, okay? you know, assuming this model makes any sense. All right? And so going back from this data that I just showed you, this is the inference that one gets. Okay, they did this separately on the different subpopulations. So each of these, they refer to things like, you know, Euro these are the Yorubans, African population. This is a Central European. There's Japanese populations, all, all sorts of different populations, abbreviated like this. And they infer the population size history of each population using this method. And, and this is what they get, like looking, um, looking back into the past, essentially. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the population size history from that data. Okay? And let me just show you a couple. Like, so this is, this is from this paper. The data wasn't quite as good back then, I guess. But here is uh, examples um, of, of the inferred population size history okay? measured in years uh, before the present. Okay? And then people do all kinds of things like they make um, inferences about this. Okay? You know, this is years before the present in units of, of mutation rate, so that's why the numbers look funny. Okay? But they're sort of inferring, okay, there's a large populations now, there was a bottleneck in the past, somehow it was bigger before that than another bottleneck, and I don't know. Okay? That's what comes out when you do this in any event. All right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's the time in years at the top, and and this is time scaled by mutation rates. Yeah, you know, in some way. Yeah. Independent verification of every slide. No, see, that's what makes this field really great or terrible, depending on your perspective, right? I mean, you you can just write this and publish it, and who's going to tell you it's wrong? I mean, yeah, that's what people are trying to do here, right? They're saying, oh, yeah, this makes sense because this corresponds to this event and this event. You know, they're, I mean, one of the, <laughs> I mean, you know, it is what it is. I, I mean, the, the thing about it is, I mean, to sort of come back and say sort of rude things that Ilya was encouraging me to say earlier, um, <laughs> I mean, I really, like, there's an enormous amount of effort, I mean, hundreds if not thousands of papers and like you know huge research efforts directed at you know arguing about you know different methods for inferring n of t and like should we do stepwise things or exponential things and which of these converge better or worse and details of the statistical uh, procedures used to do the inference and like you know corrections to the sequential Markovian coalescent because it's not actually exactly Markovian and all those kind of details um, 
because it's like something you can do. And like actually getting the right answer seems to be a low priority. Um, you know, whether the, whether the model is, you know, completely misspecified and all of this stuff is nonsense is just not something that people worry about. Um, can, I, can I just... Yeah. So what, an exercise sort of trying to explain the data and draw curves, I mean, yeah, you can print them and you can put them on the wall, but yeah. what they're going to do with their stack, right? So presumably, hopefully, people are doing this not just to publish a paper and get a nice plot, but to make some prediction, right? So is there, in all of this, hundreds and thousands of papers, are there predictions that are made? See, I mean, I guess, at least possibly I guess, see, this is a difference between, between physicists and evolutionary biologists. I would say a lot of these people don't want to make a prediction. They are actually interested in history for its own sake, right? And they're just interested in human population history and they argue that like that's an interesting subject, and they're not trying to make a prediction. They're but even even then, they're still you know uh, you're still making a prediction that presumably if, if somebody goes and tries doing archaeological digs in yes. a place where these people have lived, they will find that there are yeah. a thousand people, but not ten. Yeah, abso absolutely. Right? So are they actually putting their Names there and say that oh yeah you uh, oh yes them. yes 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 I mean this is something I mean if you read the New York Times there's quite a lot about this on a fairly regular basis so yes so I, I mean now let me just sort of raise a point that like I mean this is a long time ago you know on these kind of plots and one of the things about like these kind of, from this kind of data it's actually difficult as you can sort of tell from this just looking at this plot you have more resolution into the sort of more distant past than the very recent past. Just because there aren't that many coalescent events in the very recent past, and so you, you have limited resolution there. Um, but people are, I mean, so, you know, my colleague David Reich is one of the best known, or Svante Pabo, many others, uh, you know, are digging up graveyards all over the world and sequencing bones. Uh, you know, from hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands of years old, right? People are digging up Neanderthals. People are, you know, digging up, you know, other ancient uh, 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 populations like Denisovans and so on. And so there is actually a tremendous amount of effort this way. Um, it's leading to, and it's leading to a sort of revolution in archaeology, which is, you know, causing a lot of. Um, causing a lot of fuss and a lot of stir. Because like, I mean, some of the things that they discover are, 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 brought, are clearly sort of consistent with what we know from archaeology. Some of them are not, and it's clear that the archaeology is wrong. Um, and it's sort of overturning sort of long-held beliefs. So like, you know, for example, right, there's this, I was just listening to Nick Patterson talk. Um, he, you know, there, I don't know, how many of you are British or? few Brits, right? So I, I, don't, I don't remember the details. Of this. this isn't my story, right? But there's like, there's some, there was some event in, in Britain, you know, thousands of years ago where some particular population, the, the, they, they said it was like some Pixish or something, Pic, Pictish, right, yeah. So there was some explosion of Pictic, Pictish culture. Don't quote me on this because I, I, I'm just, I'm, this is like second or third hand. I'm just repeating what I heard in a talk a, few, a week ago. But th there was this explosion of this culture in Britain, and it was sort of long believed based on archaeological evidence that this was just a cultural shift and that the sort of population of Britain was the sort of same as the ancestral population of Britain, but they had picked up these cultural influences from these Pictish groups on the continent. And it turns out from like digging up all these bones and sequencing them that, that no, I mean, these, this group came to Britain from Europe and basically wiped out the native population. And, you know, that was now the, you know, just replaced the population to a large extent. Obviously, there was some gene flow and so on. But um, so, so, yeah, there is a lot of stuff like this that's, that's going on. It's, it's super interesting, actually. And, I mean, the other aspect of this that's quite important in practice is... The details of population structure have a great practical importance in methods, in, you know, in basically in, in inferring based on certain types of data, 
the link, the, the, the genetic basis of phenotypic traits of interest, particularly diseases, right, and other things. And so, you know, I mean, what people do, this is a whole separate talk, uh, I mean, a whole separate series of lectures, in fact, right? But, I mean, one of the sort of major efforts in human population genetics and in all sorts of population genetics is, you know, you sequence a bunch of individuals, you know, often hundreds of thousands of people, okay, and, you know, you find all the people that have schizophrenia or all the people that have, you know, whatever, whatever disease that you're interested in. And you, you know, you want to know, well, what is, the, what is the genetic underpinning of that disease? Which particular mutations are responsible for schizophrenia or for height or for intelligence or whatever you like? And so you want to try to do that by making associations between genotype and phenotype. What you want to do is say, well, all the individuals that, you know, had schizophrenia, they had a, you know, they were more likely to have this mutation or that mutation. And, you know, that helps tell you, okay, these mutations predispose you to schizophrenia or whatever the, the disease of interest is, which then, you know, become potential drug targets or whatever, right? And, um, but population structure and population history is a major confounder in this, right? You could imagine that if schizophrenia for various environmental reasons is more common in some particular region, which is enriched for some of these populations and not others, that you know, that's going to lead to enrichments in alleles that you know, are just markers of the populations and have nothing to do with the disease. And that's a major issue, and you really need to understand the population structure if you're going to tease that apart. So it is like actually practically important for those purposes. Okay. There are many other examples, but yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm embarrassed to ask this question because I, I, I thought of this saying it this, but I now it's totally wrong. I realize that I don't understand the definition of this region that coalesces. So you said that like all along the branches you were having mutations going on all the time. Yeah. So what is the difference between those mutations and the ones that you, what's the definition of a split? What is that a split? Yeah, so. This basically means, you know, these individuals, they can coalesce with one another, okay? But they can't coalesce with these individuals. But at some point in the past, they could, okay? So, like, a natural example of this is if, you know, if you think about European and African populations, okay? So, you know, if we think back in time, okay? You know, if we have two European individuals in the present and two European, African individuals in the present, let's say, the two European individuals, you know, they could have shared a common ancestor a thousand years ago, but it's highly unlikely that they shared an ancestor with either of the African individuals a thousand years ago, okay? Because the Europeans were sort of all mating with each other and the Africans were mating with each other, but they weren't, you know, intermating, at least not much. But then, you know, if we look back 50,000 years ago, the ancestors of the Europeans and the ancestors of the Africans were all living in Africa, and they could all have interbred with one another, okay? And so what this is showing, when I draw something in my very bad way, okay, let me just draw those two things like this. These are the Europeans, let's say these are the Africans. Up until some point in the past, they could only coalesce with each other you know, among, within the group, but, you know, more than 50,000 years ago or whatever that out of Africa time was, they could all coalesce. So that's what this sort of diagram is showing. Okay. And we can model all of these things. Is that? No, I mean, there may be... There may be individual, there may be European, there may be a pair of European individuals, or more precisely, part of the genomes of a pair of European individuals because of the recombination effect, right? But there might be some part of, you know, I, I, I don't want to guess at who here has European ancestry, right? But, you know, two of the white folks in the room have some genome, right? Part of their genome that just by chance, it didn't coalesce for 50,000 years, okay? And so, I mean, and there will be such regions, right? Just because, I mean, this is a, you know, there's some probability distribution. And so, you know, much of your genomes will have coalesced 
in the relatively recent past, but parts of it won't have coalesced, right? And those parts, the ancestry, you know, you had one ancestor that lived in Africa before the, uh, before the out of Africa migration. Somebody else had a different ancestor. And, you know, your, that region of your genome could have coalesced with some modern day European, Yoruban before it coalesced with your fellow European, right? And, and you know, th those signatures should exist then, right? At, in those regions of your genome, you are more, you know, the, the, the tree, I mean, basically what that's showing is, let's say that I were to sequence, um, you know, two Europeans and a Yoruban, in most of the genome, the tree will look like this, European one, European two, Yoruban, okay? But occasionally, you'll get a tree, you know, some region of the genome where the tree will instead look like this, European one, Yoruban, European two. Well, let me ask you like, the simplest way. Yeah. You're just two people of European ancestry. You will have more commonalities. Yeah, you will have a lower heterozygosity with other Europeans than you will with Africans, on average. But it's sort of a quantitative thing. Yeah, what? it's a quantitative thing. Each of these branches are dressed by lots of little guys. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, right? It's a complex, right? Like in in. In practice, right, what people do is, like, it's not like people predefine these populations, right? I mean, maybe they do to some extent, right? But in principle, what you should be doing is, like, you sequence a whole bunch of individuals, and you don't know what the history is, and you try to infer, like, what are the populations by looking for groups of individuals that are, right? And, yeah. And, and let me just, okay, so let me just jump ahead. Oops. Let me just jump ahead. So here's an example from um, Melinda Yang's PhD thesis. She was a grad student with, um, with Rasmus Nielsen, I believe, I believe Rasmus, who does all this, right? So this is an example of like the kind of things that you try to infer, okay? So here's like a whole bunch of different, you know, human populations, French, Han Chinese, Papua New Guinea, various African populations, the Yoruba, the San. This is Neanderthals and Denisovans. You know, there's some dots here because like people have actually dug up bones and sequenced them. And so you don't only have samples from the present, you actually have some samples from the past. And then, you know, people sort of look at like, okay, let's infer the times at which these populations sort of merged or split these and these gene flow rates as well, right? Because there is gene flow, you know. No, it's not about single mutations. It's about like, yeah, the whole structure of the genome, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I just wanted to point out, right? So, you know, I mentioned that people do this not just in humans. Here's an example from these fish, okay, that live in Africa in this uh, lake. I think these are from Lake Malawi, okay? Same kind of deal, exact same kind of method applied to sequence data from, the, from, from this. Looks kind of suspiciously similar, the population size that is inferred. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, right, there's two kinds of error bars, right? If you assume the modeling framework is correct, right, then one can compute sampling variance and the corresponding error bars. And you can, I mean, I don't, I don't know. They don't, it's not plotted here. I don't know what it is. But you can kind of roughly guess what it is just by looking at these curves, right? But then, you know, there's obviously like error coming from, you know, misspecification of the model, which is something that they, they really can't and don't try to quantify. Right. Typical for this type of model to people calculate the likelihood of data within a model, so the model as a generative model and calculating yes. the likelihood and basically comparing what I'm saying and, and, and comparing it to the likelihood of the data which they would have generated from the model. 
are the two comparable? Is the model good, or is the model just because we put it in? And it is. It? Well, I mean, and this is like a, a kind of a a really disturbing thing about this whole field, or an exciting thing, you know, depending on your point of view. It certainly suggests there's a lot of stuff to do. Um, you know, this data is essentially, it's all based on the site frequency spectrum, right? It's, uh, derivatives of the site frequency spectrum. And so what you can do is, right, you know, you assume the model is correct, you infer the parameters, you know, you make this fit. And then, you know, you can produce data based on the model and ask about goodness of fit. And the basic, you know, answer is, I mean, this is not always true, but often, in terms of the data that was used to fit the model, okay, so like the site frequency spectra that you get out, or the distributions of coalescence times that you get out of that process, it is actually reasonably good, right? So like it's a, the model is a good fit to the data when you're talking about the data that was used to infer the parameters of the model, right? Now what you should really do, but which people almost never do, is try to construct some statistic describing the diversity in the data that was not used to fit the model, okay? So like, you know, one, you know, things that we could do, like this, all this stuff about coalescence times, it's about like single site statistics. One could look at like correlations in frequencies at nearby sites, which is like an aspect that's, it's not captured by the site frequency spectrum, and it's not used to fit at least this particular model. And I mean, I don't want to overgeneralize because often people don't, don't do this, but at least in the stuff that I've seen, I have never seen a case where when you take the inferred model and you predict what data you would expect for some aspect of the data that was not used to infer the model, that you get something that is even remotely correct. Or, you know, like, inevitably it's like wildly off. And so that obviously suggests a problem. Okay. But that is the state of things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, okay, I, I don't want to get into in, in more. But yeah, I mean, it's like on the error of the kind of variation between the things, I imagine. But I'd have to go into this. This is obviously not our work, so I, I'm not sure. Okay, yeah. Uh, basically, you're saying the only things that we're going into this model are the population size and the mutation rate. Yeah. And we have no selection. Yes. Purely neutral. Yes. I think you were hinting earlier that if you add in selection, yeah. you get it. Right. Slightly better. Uh, so, have people done add in selection? In well, I mean, so my, I mean, that's sort of like the whole sort of um, basis for the theoretical work that I'm doing in my lab, and that a bunch of other people, many of from this sort of general physics community and, and some others, are doing. So there are like a group of us that are trying to do that, okay? But I would say that that group is tiny compared to the group of people doing demographic inference of this type. And um, so yes, it's something that people are starting to work on. It's what I think is the sort of most important direction, and that's why I'm working on it. Um, but it is not as widespread as one would like. Yeah, so we're going to talk about that now. Okay, that's where I'm going to go. So, yeah. Um, there are, I mean, I'll talk about that tomorrow um, because, I mean, you know, as some of you know, I also have an experimental lab. We do experiments. Other people do experiments on bacteria, on yeast. Some people work on Drosophila. And yeah, then we know something about the ground truth, essentially, and we can compute these things. I mean, the answer is basically that, um, you know, you clearly don't see anything like this. Now, whether that's because of some difference, though, between you know, bacteria or yeast in the lab and humans, we can't really say. But it is certainly true, and I'll talk about this tomorrow. I'm going to show some you know, experiments and just give you a sense of the kinds of things you can do 
Uh, and they certainly are drastically different from this picture and show sort of widespread importance of selection okay, in shaping diversity. All right. So what I want to do now is, so, 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 so I just want to sort of summarize like where we are in terms of, so I started by like, you know, what kinds of models should we think about this push towards like simple models of sort of core sort of foundational processes and evolution and what their implications are. And, you know, I sort of defined these simple, this sort of very simple model and the kind of observables we want to calculate. And then over the course of yesterday and today, what I've been talking about sort of is, is, is you know, what is known, what has been extensively studied by people working in this field, okay? And we've seen sort of two classes of things. We've seen, you know, evolution at a single locus, right? All those things with the diffusion equations and stuff. And we looked at mutations, selection, and genetic drift at a single locus. And so to the extent that genomes are collections of independent loci, we can calculate everything, OK? And, and just now, we talked about, um, you know, evolution of, you know, linked regions, you know, but only, that's the, this whole coalescent theory, but only in the case where all the mutations are neutral, okay? So at least to my thinking, and not everyone would agree with this, but, but, but my view is that, you know, there's an obvious huge gap here. Okay. We know that you know recombination is not perfect, right? There's, there's linked regions. That's why. I mean, in fact, that's why these methods like PSMC work, right? If every site was independent, if recombination was common enough that every site was independent, then you couldn't do the stuff that 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 I was just showing you because you need regions that have a common ancestry in order to estimate coalescence times in that region. If it was only one site, well, that site, I mean, it's either heterozygous or homozygous, right? I mean, what can you say? Right? What you need is regions that have common ancestry that is share, you know, shared common ancestry where you can say you know, this whole region has this common ancestry and we can estimate the heterozygosity and hence the coalescence time in that region. So we know that the sort of linked regions are important, but we can only understand them if they're neutral. Okay? And similarly, we know about evolution at a single locus, but, but only if everything was independent. So there's a sort of natural gap Okay, where what we need to have is some kind of uh, theoretical framework for analyzing you know, evolution of linked regions of genomes where natural selection is acting. All right? And so you know, here is where you know, I have basically an hour and 45 minutes left between you know, the remainder of this lecture and tomorrow. And what I'm going to try to do is tell you about work you know, done in part by my lab and by other groups with similar sort of perspectives, many of whom you know, come from this general community, folks like you know, my uh, PhD advisor, Daniel Fisher, or Boris Schreiman, Michael Lessig, Oscar Halicek, Daniel Weissman, many of you guys know these folks, all working on these kind of things. I'll, I'll talk about, uh, about some of that work, all right? And so I'm going to start with, with theory, and then we'll, we'll transition a bit into experimental work that you, we can also do uh, in microbes and yeast in the lab to look at these questions. So we're going to think about models of selection you know, acting uh, on you know, some linked region of a genome. Okay. One of these regions in which recombination hasn't occurred on the relevant coalescence timescales. Right? Even when there's selection, right, there's still this, this coalescent theory, like, it's still, like, there's still a coalescent ancestry of any sample, right? That still exists, all right? It's just that we don't know how to predict what the statistics should look like, right? And, and yeah, I, I meant to say this, right? But, Unlike things like recombination or population size history or something, right? Like, you know, we talked about, you know, the distribution of coalescence times on these, on these trees, 
okay, and the topologies and so on. And we talked about it in the sort of very simplest case. We talked about then how we could incorporate population structure like this or variable population size history. The thing you really just cannot incorporate into this framework using the kind of thinking I've been describing so far is selection. And it's basically because natural selection sort of breaks this independence between the mutations and the genealogies. Right? The whole idea behind this approach was we could think about the probability distribution of any genealogical ancestry and then think about mutations as happening at random on these trees. Okay? But when you have selection, that just isn't the case. Right? Like If I have some deleterious mutation here, that makes this whole tree much less likely. Right? And so I cannot think about these things independently. So there are some methods, like there's a method called the ancestral selection graph, which is in a sort of attempt to fix this problem within this context. But it's basically intractable in situations relevant to modern data. All right. So there is still some distribution of genealogies. And there is still some set of mutations on those genealogies. Those things are no longer independent. Um, and of course, the selection changes the whole distribution of genealogies in ways that we don't know. But it, it, it does still exist. Okay. So what we're going to think about is models of selection on linked regions that are, you know, at, at least for the purposes of, of, of now, that are sort of, you know, they're linked over the time scales of the ancestry here. So they're one of these regions we can think of as not recombining on the relevant time scale. And we want to think about how selection alters the the, the diversity, and we, we will, well, let me talk about specifically what we'll calculate. All right. Basically, I'm going to talk about two very simple models. Okay. So, first, purifying selection. Okay. And then positive selection. Okay? Not because, I mean, they're really, we need more general models okay, that combine these two, but y you, know, you guys should come work on this area uh, and, 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 uh, and try to get us there. Anyway, the, what I'm going to start with, okay, we're going to have some population size, some u, and some rho of s in both of these cases. Okay? And you know, there's been a lot of work by my group and other groups in trying to make this as general as possible. We're going to talk about it in the simplest context, though, just because that's how I can do it in the amount of time available. We're going to imagine, okay, for this model of purifying selection, we only have one kind of mutation, well, two kinds of mutations. We have neutral mutations and deleterious mutations. And the deleterious mutations all have some characteristic cost. SD. Okay? We're working on more general models where we have, you know, more complicated distributions and so on, but I'm not going to talk about them uh, because I don't have time. And here we'll think about the obvious other uh, opposite version of this. Same idea, now we just have neutral mutations and beneficial mutations. The beneficial mutations have effect SB. Okay. In reality, obviously, then you, know, you want to combine the joint model where you have UN, UD, and UB, and SB, D, and SB. More generally, you want to just have an NU and an arbitrary rho of S. But this is what I'm going to talk about to sort of highlight some of the issues. Okay. And what are we going to try to calculate? Well, the two same kind of, the same kind of observables that we did before, right? diversity and divergence. So we want to compute the SFS, that's diversity, and divergence, P fix of S, and corresponding you know, V from this. Same here. right? What is the SFS? What is the fixation probability? right? And what is V? Right? In this case, there's only one relevant S, but we want to know the fixation probability of those mutations as a function of what that S is. Okay. So that's what we're going to talk about. And I'm just going to start here. Okay? I could start here, but I'm going to start here. 
Um, people have been thinking about this for a long time. So there's this guy, Brian Charlesworth, and in the early 90s, well, I guess maybe even in the late 80s, okay, there was this observation that was made that if you looked at regions of the genome, so recombination rates are not uniform across the genome, okay, uh, for various kinds of reasons. If you look at regions of the genome with high recombination rates, they tended to have lower diversity, okay, meaning that uh, there was um, there was less um, heterozygosities were lower, okay, and therefore right coalescence times were shorter, okay, in regions of high recombination, okay. Uh, uh, sorry, the other way around, regions of low recombination had less diversity. Uh, than regions of high recombination. And, um, you know, people at the time were sort of saying, well, you know, this is a signature of positive selection. If you have a region of low recombination, the kind of linked region that has shared ancestry is bigger. And therefore, it's more likely that there's some beneficial mutation that arises. And if you think about it, if a beneficial mutation arises, and it increases in frequency, that reduces the diversity in those linked regions. Okay. And Charlesworth realized that no, actually, and this is a sort of early example of like realizing how identifiability is a real big problem, you know. To respond to Ilya, it's sort of it's it's too easy to fit the data, not too hard. One could get exactly the same result, even in the absence of beneficial mutations, just in this simple model. Okay. And the basic intuition that, that he came up with, and there's a really sort of influential paper from, I think, 1993 that he published explaining this in some detail, is that you know, if you have bigger regions okay, of the genome that are linked, as in regions of lower recombination, there will also be more deleterious mutations happening. So the effect of you in your model should be bigger. right? And now, if you think about it, Let's imagine we have some population, some, some population, we have some higher mutation rate, a deleterious mutation rate. What happens to deleterious mutants, right? You, individuals with deleterious mutations are less likely to leave offspring into the future. That's what deleterious mutations mean, right? And the sort of backwards time way to think about that is, like if we look around this room, right, some of you guys have more deleterious mutations than others, okay? Not to name any names, <laughs> right? But it's a fact, all right? And, it, but if we think, right, if, if we think about your parents, right, your parents on average had less deleterious mutations than you guys, right? They're fitter than you on average. Why is that, right? I mean, because some of y'all don't have kids, right? All of your parents have kids, right? <laughs> and like the further back in time we go, right, the more true that is, right? Your grandparents are fitter still. Not only do they have kids, but they have grandkids, right? And like the further back in time we go, right, the fitter the, po the sub, right, there's some subset of the population in the past that gave rise to the individuals in the present. And, and the rest of them, you know, they didn't have kids or their kids didn't have kids or whatever, right? And, you know, by definition, that subset of the population, the further and further back you go in the past, the fitter it is, right? Because that's what fitness means, right? The individuals in the past that gave rise to the most individuals in the present are by definition the sort of fittest individuals in the past, right? And so Charlesworth's intuition was basically that, like, you know, he thought about deleterious mutations, they really suck, you know? And so, like, if we think about, you know, the ancestry, I mean, he sort of thought this process would happen really fast. Like, if we look in the population in the present, sure, there are individuals with deleterious mutations, but they're very quickly descended from this smaller subset of population that didn't have any deleterious mutations. Yeah? Sorry, I, I, this, this bothers me. 
assigning a fitness to an individual now, right, based on what's going to happen far, far into the future, yep. right? Many, many generations yeah. into the future, right? Yep. So is it even meaningful then to talk about a fitness attached to an individual? Well, I mean, so this goes back to like my first lecture, right? Like there's a lot of other things we could think about, right? But, you know, if we assume that, you know, there's no, that all these, like, things, that there's no interactions between individuals, you know, there's no, there's no ecological interactions that we're worrying about, that the selective environment stays the same over, you know, this long time period, then, then yes. I mean, one can talk about that, you know, in the context of this model. Now, whether that's realistic or not is a question I don't want to get into. But anyway, that it is okay here, right? But the point of this intuition, okay, I, I, am, I have two minutes left, so let me just uh, try to get through this, and then we'll pick it up here next time. Because all the individuals in the present are descended from a small subset of individuals in Charlesworth's idea in the recent past that didn't have deleterious mutations, the population size is kind of effectively smaller. Okay? And if you have regions of low recombination, the deleterious mutation rates are higher. There's more deleterious mutations. The subset of the population that doesn't have any is smaller. Okay? And so basically, the more deleterious mutations, the lower the, recombina the, lower the recombination rate, the more deleterious mutations within a, a, a linked region, and therefore the smaller the effective population size, and therefore less diversity. Okay? And he basically argued that this just meant you know, neutral mutations are still happening. And because we're so recently descended from individuals that don't have any deleterious mutations, we can sort of think of the population as a sort of neutral population, you know, which would have this, you know, 1 over x site frequency spectrum, for example, of the neutral mutations that are happening, okay? But with a smaller effective population size, a sort of smaller theta, uh, and the, the, the amount smaller that that theta is depends on the u and, and also on the s. Okay? And uh, we will pick up there next time. Basically, what we're going to start with next time is we're going to think about, all right, within the present, in this very simple model, individuals have different numbers of deleterious mutations. So some individuals have 0, 1, two, three, four, and so on. Okay? And that leads to some distribution. right? These are those of you that are highly fit. These are those of you that, you know, not so great. All right? Some distribution of this. All right? We'll compute what we expect this distribution to look like. And then we'll think about, like, okay, so this is the sort of subset of the individuals, this sort of effective population size here. But we'll think about a sort of more nuanced description of like, let's imagine we sample individuals from the present. You know, I might sample, you know, this is one of you guys with bad luck, one of you guys a little more lucky than, than average, right? And we can think about your parents and your grandparents and so on. And backwards in time, you're descended from individuals with less deleterious mutations. And eventually your descent, you know, you, you have coalescence events. And we'll think about what that is and how that affects the site frequency spectrum and the heterozygosity, et cetera. All right? And we'll also talk a bit about these questions, because these deleterious mutations could, in principle, fix. And that'll lead to some V, which in this case is negative, because the pop there's no beneficial mutations. The population can only go down. All right? And then we'll talk about this, and we'll talk about some experiments. All right, so I'll stop there for today. Well, that's the Charlesworth intuition. And we'll see it's not actually a great approximation. But I mean, it is true that it does sort of, at least in a qualitative sense, mean that there's less diversity. Okay? But it, it will turn out not to just be a reduction in N. He just picked it that way because, you know, I mean, these guys, they all think about everything is effective population size. But we'll see that's not actually, like, in quantitative detail, that's pretty bad.
although qualitatively it is less diversity. All right, I guess we're supposed to take